we live in an imperfect world. It doesn't take much to look around you and see that things could be a lot better. This is why we can't wait for a perfect world to come before we can practice. And we can't demand perfect surroundings, a perfect situation, a perfect society, a perfect monastery. We have to make the best of what we've got. When you look here at the monastery, it's the product of generosity. Think of all the generous thoughts and generous actions that have gone into creating this place. And still, it's not perfect. And there's no one in charge, as we chanted just now. I guess acts of generosity have to be allowed a certain amount of freedom. In fact, the Buddha was very strict about how he would have the monks talk to lay people about their generosity. Monks are not allowed to hint or scheme, try to figure out ways to squeeze a little more generosity out of people. When someone comes to them, they, they can't say, if someone says, where should this be given? The monks can't say, well, give it here or give it there. They simply say, okay, give where you feel most inspired, or you feel that your gift would be well used, well cared for. And we currently say, certainly can't say, don't give to this person, give to that, or don't give to that monastery, give to this one. As the Buddha said, when you say, get in the way of people's generosity, you create a lot of bad karma. Which is why when you look around the monastery, you see things that don't really seem to belong here, or in the best of all possible worlds, wouldn't be here. But it is the product of somebody's generosity, and you have to honor the freedom they had in giving. So it means you have to tread very lightly on how imperfect the world is around you. Because sometimes the imperfections are there because people met well, but they didn't understand or they didn't really think things through. This applies not just to the monastery, but to the world at large. And if you try to force people to behave in line with what your ideas are about how things should be run, you usually find there's going to be a reaction. This is why the Buddha said we shouldn't spend our time hoping to perfect the world. It's never going to be perfected. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to perfect our minds. Perfect here mean, meaning finding true freedom within the mind. The principles go together. You allow for freedom to operate outside. So you can learn how to develop freedom within. The more you try to control things outside, especially if the control gets unskillful, the more tied up you get inside. So this is why the principle of contentment has two very different dimensions. The one is the dimension dealing with things outside. Any situation where you have the opportunity to practice, you should be content with the level of support you get, the food, clothing, shelter, medicine that are available. Not get worked up over things when they're not nice. Try not to get too attached to them when they are nice. Even down to the point of not making it a point of conceit that you are content with things outside. The Buddha's teachings were that detailed and subtle. The reason you're content is because you want to create as much space in your mind for the practice as possible. 
And the more you get worked up over how things are outside, this should be that way, that should be this way, there's less and less space for you to actually practice. As for what's going on in the mind, that's where the Buddha said you should not rest content. He said this was the secret to his awakening. At least he didn't allow himself to rest content with skillful qualities. The only point where he allowed himself contentment was when he finally reached awakening and found the true happiness, the deathless happiness he'd been looking for. Up to that point, there was always that search for something better. I mean, the search for looking for ways to how to improve the quality of his mind. It starts with looking at his actions, thoughts, words, and deeds on an ordinary, everyday level, seeing what kind of impact they had, and looking to see the thoughts and words and deeds that had a good impact. What kind of mind states did they come from? Same with the ones that had a bad impact. What kind of mind states did they come from? But at one point he said that's how he got started on the path, by learning how to make that distinction. Looking at his thoughts, not, much in, not so much in terms of their content, but seeing them as part of a process of cause and effect. Where did they come from? Where did they lead? And then learning how to keep the unskillful ones in check and to give free rein to the skillful ones. But even then, he said, you give total free rein to your skillful thoughts and the mind gets tired after a while. So even they have their limitations. So the most skillful thing there is to try to find a way of bringing the mind into a right concentration. Now all of this involves actively cultivating certain mind states and actively trying to check other ones. In other words, we're not here just to watch things come and go. I was actually reading a book a while back and made a distinction, they said, between right mindfulness practice and right effort practice, as if there were two separate practices. I mean, that's definitely a wrong view, capital letters. The idea being that right effort is when you Try to get rid of unskillful states and foster skillful ones. Right mindfulness practice being when you just allow whatever to come comes up to come up and don't try to interfere with it. The Buddha never taught that at all. Right effort and right mindfulness have to go together. You keep things in mind so that you can certain things in mind so that you can work on being more and more skillful in your right effort. There's work to be done inside. Now, the times when you simply watch are the ones when you want to see, well, if you don't understand why a certain unskillful mental state is coming up, you want to watch it. But again, you're not just allowing yourself to get into it the way you normally did. You have to step back. You have to develop the quality of mindfulness, the quality of concentration, the quality of discernment. So you can really learn from your unskillful mental states. It's like back in the days of the Cold War, the people who studied Russian because they wanted to figure out the enemy. You've got to watch out for these unskillful states because they really can lead you astray. They really can cause a lot of suffering. You can't just be very blasé about them and say, well, I have to be content with everything, so I have to be content with the fact that the mind, my mind is a mess. That's not what the Buddha had in mind at all. When the mind is a mess, you want to be able to step back at least a little bit to watch it, to figure out, well, where is this coming from? What's going on here? So you can develop the understanding. And you see how allowing certain thoughts to come into the mind, certain ideas that you hold on to can create problems down the line. And the only way you're going to get past unskillful states is to understand, understand that process of cause and effect, so that when you finally see a particular attitude or a particular belief leading to unskillful states, you can realize, okay, this is the cause of the problem. 
when you realize that you don't have to hold on to that attitude, you don't have to hold on to that belief, you can drop it. That's when you really let go. It's that combination, one, of seeing that the attitude causes suffering, and two, that it's not necessary. You don't have to hold on to it. You don't have to pick it up even. That's when you get in the discernment that allows you really to let go of things. Otherwise, you tell yourself to let go, let go, let go, but you don't really understand. Or part of you hasn't really seen that the suffering that you're undergoing is unnecessary. In that case, you can tell yourself to let go of all day long, and the mind still doesn't really let go. The attachment is just waiting there in the wings. And if you don't take charge of the situation inside your mind, these thoughts just run rampant. It's that principle of no one in charge. In the case of the mind, actually offers you the possibility that you could take charge. And your defilements are in charge. Greed, anger, and delusion are in charge. And they don't really have any clear plan for you. Each thought, each emotion has a little bit of a plan for what might lead to happiness, but they're not really organized. This is why discernment can come in as it starts pointing things out to your various desires. You learn how to learn how to begin to let go, because each desire does have a certain rationale behind it. And every desire you have has the idea that it would lead to happiness. So this is where you can talk to the desires. This is where you, where you have common ground. You want happiness. They want happiness. But they're all misguided as to what happiness might be and where it might be found. So this is how you take the right view that the Buddha taught, to learn how to train your desires. For all, desire is part of the path. Skillful desires come under right effort. So you want to take your desires and train them. So you do have a clear and clear idea of where true happiness might be found. That way you find you gain greater and greater unity in the mind, unanimity in the mind. When the mind is working together like this, okay, then it then it develops a lot of strength. If you have a lot of unexamined thoughts and unexamined assumptions still sloshing around in the mind, they're going to drag you down. You can't gain awakening simply through force of willpower or blocking things out. This, that's not what abandoning means. Abandoning means that you would let go through understanding. And you develop the mindfulness and the concentration that allow you to watch the mind so you really can understand the principle of cause and effect and see exactly where you're handling that principle in an unskillful way. So even though there are times when you simply have to watch things, the underlying purpose is that you finally understand them and you can let them go. And then you check again to see if there are other more subtle levels of suffering, more subtle levels of stress that you're still maintaining. That's how the practice develops. So on the one hand, you learn contentment in terms of your material levels of comfort. And you have to learn how to content yourself and develop some equanimity around areas of the world that you look at them and you say, that's really sad that that's the way things are. But if you look at how much effort you would have to put in to change those things and wondering somehow, what would happen if I did make that effort? What would be the unintended consequences? There are a lot of things in the world that you have to let go, you have to allow to be. 
because otherwise there's no way you're going to be able to train your mind. And your mind is the only thing where you really can take charge and you really can be responsible. There's a pun in Thai on the word what. On the one hand, what means monastery, and on the other hand, it means your practice, your, your daily regimen, and particularly the regimen inside the mind. And as John Fung used to say, the outside what, the monastery out there, is something that we work at, and we try to get it nice, and we try to get it well run. However, with the understanding that it's never going to be perfect. And if you spend too much effort on the outside what, then the inside what gets neglected. So we're working on the inside what, your inside regimen here. The area where the Buddha says, don't let yourself rest content. Now, this doesn't mean you have to drive yourself to the point where you're frazzled. I mean, skillful effort means that you learn how to pace yourself, that you know what you're capable of, and push yourself a little bit more, a little bit more. But if you find that the pushing more and more and more is getting worse results, then you back off a bit. You say, well, I'm not ready for that. This is not something you can squeeze, that you can pull on, like John Tate's images of planting rice. And then you're not content that the rice plants are growing as fast as you like, then you pull and pull and pull on them to make them taller. And of course, what you do is you pull them out of the ground. But you learn how to pace yourself with the thought in mind, if there's some way that you can learn how to develop greater strength. The practice will go more quickly. The results will be more solid. So you look for various ways to give yourself more strength. Strengthen your conviction, strengthen your effort, strengthen your mindfulness, strengthen your concentration and discernment. So that you're capable of more. In other words, you accept responsibility. That's the kind of acceptance that the Buddha really does encourage. On the outside level, you accept the way things are, but on the inside level, you accept the, point, the fact that you have some powers to make some changes here, and you want to develop those powers as much as you can. As wisely as you can, as effectively as you can. Because that's where the practice of right effort really pays off. As the Buddha said, a deathless happiness is a possibility. It's something that human beings can do. And you should see that as the most tantalizing thing that a human being can do. And order your other priorities in line with that.